call a meeting. Six o'clock, I'd like to call, call a meeting of the select board, uh, October 17th, 2023. Uh, first things, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Um, um, so I think we're going to delete yeah. uh, the self Woodstock design updates, uh, and I'll cover that in my manager's report. So, okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Citizen comments. Kareem. Uh, Kareem. Uh, Kareem online as a citizen, citizen comment. Should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Kareem. Yeah. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Hope everybody's doing okay. Um, I, I do have a quick question, perhaps we can get an update and you're probably familiar with what I'm going to be asking since I sent an email about that. Um, would it be possible to get an update on the situation of the hose that's providing water across the Elm Street Bridge? Um, it is my understanding from, from what I've heard, but that information might, might be wrong, uh, that apparently there is one action plan that is fairly complex and then there is a contingency plan that you know perhaps could kick in if the if the uh, de the desirable plan does not happen. Uh, my question is if you could tell us very briefly what those two plans are and whether there's urgency to get it done before the winter. And finally, if it doesn't get done on time, if there is urgency, what might be the implication to the rest of the water users that are connected to the water system? Thank you. Uh, so I'll cover that in my manager's update as well. As okay, great. Talk about that, so thank you. All right, thank you. Any other citizen? Jill Davies. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't respond to earlier. No, the uh, item number 10 on the investment committee can be deleted. Thank you. Any other comments? Hey, you're up, Eric. Um, so a few things. First, uh, I signed in an agreement with the elementary school uh, for town hall to be a shelter in place in case of emergency. Uh, they'll be doing a, uh, I don't say a practice run, but uh, soon in town hall to see how that works out. Um, but it's not an option in case the worst case scenario happens, we'll be here for them. Uh, second, um, two things. Uh, one, I want to welcome Laura Powell to the, the select board, our, our newest member, um, appointed last week, I believe. So welcome. Thank you for volunteering to be part of uh, the, our group. Uh, but obviously, Laura's here because Millie Riley is no longer on the select board. Um, as everyone knows, uh, she stepped down recently. Uh, so I just want to again publicly thank her for her service. You know, all she did at Woodstock. And I look forward to seeing her around soon. Uh, next. Um, the water working group uh, for the aqueduct is start of the meeting starting tomorrow is the first meeting uh, to try to get a, a hold on what's happened with the, with the aqueduct and what the questions need to get asked uh, to look into what the future is. Uh, so they're going to start meeting tomorrow. Uh, I've been in touch numerous times with the Harvard Business uh, Group that's working with us as well on that subject. Uh, so hopefully in a few weeks we'll have a lot more uh, answers about what the future holds for that company. Uh, and on uh, the question uh, from the audience, um, I hesitate to speak too much about a private company and what their goals are, as I have no uh, direct oversight over them, as the select board does not. Uh, but it's my understanding that they're looking at a few different options, uh, depending on funding and time. Um, one of them might be able to connect a four-inch pipe underground. Uh, the, currently, the pipe on Elm Street is four inches as well, so that would continue the same amount of water service we currently have. Uh, the village obviously uh, survived foliage season with that pipe, uh, so that could get us through the winter. Uh, then the spring, they look at the option of Elm Street and, and the bridge. Uh, I think the their goal is to have a pipe go under the bridge on Elm Street. Uh, the cost is quite extensive. Uh, and something they don't believe they can handle currently uh, um, with the funds they have available to them. Uh, we're working with them on finding additional funding, potentially from the state, federal government, et cetera, uh, to make that happen. Uh, but that's probably not going to happen until at least the springtime. So the goal is to look at having this um, short-term solution for the winter and going from there. And they're as worried as we all are about getting this fixed as soon as possible. Um, 
Are there any questions on that? William has his hand up. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Appreciate you following up with them. Uh, I, I appreciate your comment about it being a private company. Um, the flip side of, of that is that uh, should they not be able to get the interim work done prior to the winter, I do believe that the select board has a responsibility to understand what might be the impact to the village, uh, given that the village is part of the town. And um, I, I guess what I'm concerned about is that we don't have a repeat of what happened uh, when we had the issues with the water lines, which is pretty much a lot of businesses and, and, and homes and residences being actually impacted, leading to the closure of many businesses. That would be disastrous again for the town. So I was wondering how, how confident, based on your, on, on your conversation, you feel about them being able to put the interim solution in place. And if they don't put it in place, do we have an understanding of what the risks are? Um, yeah, I, th I think you touched on the risks pretty accurately and you know the consequences of those risks. So I think we're all aware of that. And um, I will say it's something that I'm working on daily you know, with the aqueduct and with other people in the community that are working on this as well. Um, so we are trying to get this done as, as soon as possible. Um, again, I hesitate to speak for them uh, because they have to you know, speak for themselves, uh, but they're trying as hard as they can to get this done. The meeting with contractors, uh, the looking at funding, and from my conversations with them, uh, this is, try ha is happening as fast as possible. Okay, uh, I'm just wondering if the select board is, um, has a level of comfort with the aqueduct company uh, that they'll be able to get this done or, or should, <laughs> should we start getting worried, I guess, as a, as a village? Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't want the, again, the select board to comment on what the, um, the speed of the aqueduct to, to or what they can accomplish. But like I said, uh, I am in, in touch with them daily, trying to get this done as soon as possible. And we're hoping to have a solution done very soon. Okay, thanks. I, I would I would assume that um, there might be a way for them, just like they did an excellent job in communicating with the population during the latest crisis. If if at all possible at your next meeting, if you don't mind, Eric, requesting from them to send those emails updating us on the situation and the progress that they're making, that that would be fantastic. Yeah, it's my belief that once they know exactly what they're going to do, they'll be communicating that. I think right now they don't want to say happy with us speculating when they don't know exactly when they'll start working and how long the work will take. But once they know for sure, I'll make sure they get it out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Come on up, Peggy. Just state your name for the record and- Okay, Peggy Fraser, Woodstock Village. Um, given this, and that it's a private company, therefore not eligible for a lot of kind of FEMA money and things like that. Are you in contact with the state of Vermont in the case of an extreme emergency to happen again? Yes. Yeah, so myself, uh, the aqueduct, um, our local representatives have been in touch with the states nonstop since the original flood about this situation. They're all well aware of where we're at and they're working with us on funding and other solutions as well. The state is working with I, I had a stock, not the private company, but to assure were, us that we won't have another horrible emergency. So we're not working with the state on that um, currently. Uh, we don't have, um, there is right now no alternative to if the, there's an issue with the water company right now. Uh, we don't have a backup plan currently. The, the goal is to get the piping on under the ground as soon as possible, and that will solve the problem. Okay, I'm still a little confused because are you saying that in in the case of an emergency, the state of Vermont is not prepared to come in because the select board or our governor's governance here is in contact. And so in the case of an emergency, the state can help us. So during the- I mean, Forget the private company. I mean, what's the responsibility of the officials of Woodstock? In what sense? It's water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's not an amenity. It's basic to our lives. So 
what if the water company fails? Is the select board or whoever or people we elect, are, are you prepared to get the state involved or something that would help us so that we have water? Yeah, in case of emergency, we're going to tap every resource we have to make sure that the, the residents are not impacted at all. So in case of emergency, we would be talking to the governor to come and help us. Okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to know. Thank yeah. you. Yep. All right, can I ask um, yeah. how many people are on the working group and how often they're planning to meet? So tomorrow is their first meeting. Um, roughly off the top of my head, there are at least five members. Um, and I think that their discussion tomorrow will probably lead to how many meetings we're going to have after that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think originally they talked about meeting weekly, but it's probably going to depend on people's schedules. Uh, if there's no more comments on my general report, um, the financial report, uh, I think we got some questions um, on the taxes and how big it looked. And basically, it's, uh, the way uh, Woodstock does their accounting is accrual accounting. So once we send out the bills, that total what the bills are become, shows up um, as total revenue. Uh, and included in that is also the taxes that go towards the school. Uh, we have, write a check from our account to the state. Uh, so that's why you see such a large number in there. Unfortunately, that's not our tax revenue. Um, so there's that. And then um, I think Susan also asked about the interest being lower than, than normal. Uh, and what that is, is we have to do our general entry in our account software to allocate what interest came into the bank. Uh, with Robert just starting two weeks ago, he's not been able to catch up from over the summer. So you see in that interest account is just uh, the month of July's interest. So it's missing August and September as well. Are there any other questions? Okay. The liquor license application. Yeah, so uh, ongoing liquor license uh, uh, issue that is Susan's and mine favorite issue to have. Um, it all flows through the states. What we uh, traditionally had was the printout that showed us nothing uh, to save paper. We're not including that anymore. Um, this is, uh, I believe, Max, which is, has been bought out by another company, so just applying for that uh, liquor license. Um, I think in the past, the, the motion from the board has been to approve it pending that the state is doing all the final uh, information on their end. I would make a motion that we approve the Woodstock Village Market liquor license on the assumption that the state's looking at the application since we cannot. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. And there's no old business. Uh, Alita. We could put you at the end if you'd like. We could put you at the end if you'd like. Welcome, Laura. Um, you probably don't have this, but this is. Oh, you do. Oh, someone's sitting there doing homework. Um. So, the purpose of our meeting tonight is basically to um remind everybody that in 2022, we received a limited preservation plan for the town hall building, prepared by the architectural firm of Mills and Schnorring, who are here. And I will just say that I went to a conference, um, the um, National League of Historic Theaters, and everybody I met in the 300 people that were there were like, oh my God, you're working with them, they're amazing. Um, so the town hall project committee, which I chair, I'm not talking about Pentangle, I'm chairing that committee. Um, we reviewed the prioritization summary recommended that was submitted in March, 2023. Our committee unanimously recommended that the select board commit to completing the work laid out in urgent work priority one. And I think, um, Meredith. Do you want to walk through the priority one? 
Um, actually, Jenna's going to do that for you. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm here tonight to answer any questions, as well as Michael Schnoring. Um, we're both partners in the firm of Mills and Schnoring Architects. Jenna Arnaldi, who is a um, senior associate with the firm um, and the project architect, has the screen, I believe, or can share her screen. Do you all have priority one? Yeah, I think it should be in the booklet. Thank you, um, Alita. As Meredith said, or as Alita said, we were hired by Pentangle to produce the limited preservation plan, which consisted of condition assessment of the building, also the structural condition and a review of the previous findings on the structure of the building, uh, a code study, recommendations, as you see here, for prioritized repairs, and then cost estimate, which used allowances for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing um, work. So the goal is to plan, obviously, for the future of the building and address the code deficiencies. So as we created this, this phasing document with those things in mind, um, we identified the structural stabilization at the rear stage house as the top priority. And so just to sort of walk you through the priority, it involves underpinning the stage house to, again, stabilize it for all future uses. Um, this stabilization involves a few different steps. It's the, um, the underpinning, it's uh, beam seats to uh, support the loft beams above to reinforce the connections and the diaphragm with the roof of the building. Um, and as you can see, the subtotal there is 1.6 million. Um, the other things we put in priority one included work at the front porch and portico, which are primarily wood uh, repairs to the woodwork, um, and also the patio structure, the concrete substrate, the landing, the granite at the landing, the brick paving, um, essentially to make the entrance safe and uh, present a, a you know new front to the building. Um, including, we included the new historically appropriate light fixture uh, at that uh, area. So essentially envelope repair work. And then the other three items we included in the priority one are the items that would be required to make the stabilization happen at the rear. So those are the mechanical plumbing and electrical items that um, you know do occur in the sub-basement and the units, the air handling units that are at the rear of the building. So those would need to be either relocated or replaced um, as some of those units are quite old. And so uh, these dollar items given here are for the, that work um, to, you know, that, that particular work that we see. So, I mean, essentially the committee is asking the select board to um, commit to completing work laid out as priority one uh, that we've shown here. Um, and then continue to continue consider future work in the other priorities. We're not going to go over the other priorities um, today, but for budgeting planning uh, purposes. So I think we would take questions on priority one work uh, recommendations that we've laid out from the board. Um, if I could ask the question first. Sure. So for... Um... Priority one, we're talking about $3.2 million. Yep. Is there a way to do this like piecemeal or does it have to be the 3.2 all at once? I think what's important to do is the stabilization work. So it could be potentially phased, these items, but with a large chunk of this money, the stabilization certainly and the mechanical, um, electrical and plumbing being all part of that first phase because um, they, they just need to happen together uh, to make the stabilization work. So you'd have to be 1.6 million from the from the from the jump from the beginning. Yeah and and this is an estimate and we would develop yeah. the cost estimate with more detail as we go into a construction document phase. I mean this yeah. was a schematic level study. So as we would move into construction documents for that structural work, we would get a little closer dollar figure. Apologize about my puppy here. <laughs> I would also just add for funding resources, um, 
we're not putting this before the select board right now, but putting an easement on the building does release some funds um, from the Preservation Trust of Vermont. Um, and there are contingencies, uh, which is you put up $6,000 and then the town agrees to work with Preservation Trust of Vermont um, to be stewards of the building. Um, in addition, uh, I think I have met with um, the uh, gentleman from Torque, and we are looking at that grant doing an assessment for the HVAC system. Um, so I think there are funding, there are funding opportunities. So I'm not, I don't think that our committee is saying to the town, you all have to fund this. I think in spirit, you have to say this is an important thing to do and we can work together to figure out how we are gonna fund it. If we don't fund it, and that's fine, but you are basically saying, okay, the, the town, this building will continue to deteriorate. And that's, that's the reality. Um, so I think the purposes of us being here is saying from our committee is, this is like the minimum to keep this building alive. And uh, if we don't shore up the end of the building, the 1929 edition, we can't make any changes. Uh, doesn't mean it's gonna fall into the river. It just means that if we want to make the building uh, accessible, ADA accessible from the rear end, we can't do it without, a, without an elevator. Um. I just one more question for the engineers, for me at least. Um, the 3.2, what does that do to the life of the buildings? So if, the, if the town agreed to uh, allocate $3.2 million for this and that first work was done, what does that add to the life of the building? How long should that you know, increase our overall time in here? I mean, I think that stabilizes the rear of your building. I know it's hard to put a, a number of years on the building, but it's it's certainly many more years uh, for that rear of the building. So um, it does increase the longevity of your building significantly. And I think that leads into my question is um, other than the three point or the 380,000 for the front porch and portico, all of that all of the 3.2 is for what's considered to be the backstage. Is that right? Or maybe some of the theater? So it really isn't, it's not any other aspect of town hall other than the theater section. Is that correct? As well as systems for the building because so it doesn't. The HVAC, and the HVAC would be for the entire building or just for the theater? Those units do feed a good portion of the theater. So um, it does include HVAC improvements for the rest of the building. It doesn't include the improvements for the front of house, um, the lobby, I should say, uh, that those HVAC units are located elsewhere, but it does include HVAC for a lot of the building. So for like the offices <laughs> up here? On the second floor of the building, the town function, the municipal portion of the building. The question is, are those served in? I mean, I think again, the the system hasn't been designed yet, so I think we would have to go to the construction document level to really design the system. The idea was to consolidate some of the systems that are currently in the building, so that part of that work would cover this new consolidation of. Um, heating and, and air conditioning. And to answer your question, Susan, I did do a walkthrough with mm -hmm. the energy guys who are looking at consolidating the HVAC. Um, upstairs, we have that really old cooling unit up here, which just cools here in the in the manager's office, it's heat pumps. And so there, there, this does not include that, but there is definitely a vision of trying to make the building more um, integrated in its heating and cooling system. Of course, the theater is the biggest space. So uh, if we are able to get a grant um, that we can get rid of our big cooling unit and have an integrated system, that would be great. Now, your point on uh, shoring up the back, do we want to show up the fact? The reason to do that is 
if we want accessibility. And if, if y'all decided yeah, we don't really want access, you know, ADA accessibility from the back of the house up, it's not just a theater. It is how people come in and come up. That, that is, that is a, a real good question for you to decide because um, that little elevator requires or any future changes to the back of the building requires those underpinnings. So you could say, you know what, let's not do it. Then, okay, then there's no future changes to the back of the building. Does that make sense? Um, so. So, so how often do you have used the stage for plays or musicals or whatever? Just curious, average. Uh, good God, we 90% uh, of our programming is during the school year. So we had a show two weeks ago, 400 students came in from eight different schools. Zach's place comes in. It's, it's not that it's not used. It's not that it's not used. It's, it, is it used for big performances like we tried or did? But no, it's more community space. Okay. Um, and we'd like it to continue to be a community space. but. That is a choice. Can I add in just a, a small comment? Um, I think, you know, when we were first hired to do this project, it was really to look at the overall health of the building and what it would take to be good stewards of the building, um, which is obviously a significant community asset, not only as town hall, but also um, for theater use, but for both. But our evaluation was really looking at the building as a historic resource without um, thinking specifically about theater use versus town use. Um, it was really all about the overall health of the building and how uh, it it needs to meet code going forward, but also um, have better accessibility, et cetera, take care of things that some deferred maintenance, uh, the building hasn't had a comprehensive renovation since the 1980s. So really this, division into priorities is to take a look at the overall health of the building and really to evaluate what the most significant aspects are that need to be addressed in in sort of a priority fashion. So um, really without regard to usage of the building, but more overall as an important, significant community resource. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful because I think we could take the theater out of it take Pentangle out of it. It's a space. It's a space. Do we want to have this largest public space in Woodstock continue for years to come? And it could not be the stage. It could be whatever, whatever, you know, select board wants to do with the space. But I think Meredith's point is, if we don't take care of the building now, we won't have a building, regardless. And so it, it it's not about a stage or a stage house. It's about the box, the big box. How are we going to take care of it? Or decide that priority wise, maybe we don't take care of it. I know it's not a popular question, but what would a comparable cost of that addition were taken off of those? It's a million dollars to take it off, at least. So can I ask? And back when there was a previous committee, there was an issue with needing an easement from the neighbor. Is that still an issue? The only reason that we were talking to the neighbor was there was a suggestion of creating a wing space, which would have gone into the driveway. And the new neighbors are lovely, but it, that is not feasible. And, and I think the one thing we've learned from both teams is it's a very narrow space. It's a box. We can't go left. We can't go right. They're just, you know, we've got what we've got. Um, so a few questions online, but I just have one more question for the engineers. Um, based on your study, if, if the uh, town voted to do nothing to town hall, um, what's the condition of town hall like in five years in your expert opinions? I mean, a town, a building needs regular maintenance and upkeep. So the condition of town hall from an envelope 
uh, perspective continues to deteriorate. I mean, you already have leaky windows and, um, you know, problems coming off the roof eaves of water, which is penetrating the walls. There's some damage from probably internal leaders that's uh, causing leaking on the interior of the walls. Um, you know, and there's this, the stage house, um, you know, should be stabilized to keep the entire structure um, from from moving. I mean, it's it's not showing any signs of moving at the moment, but it's it's just a reasonable idea to keep the building structurally sound. So uh, that's why our recommendation is to do the repairs uh, and prioritize them with with envelope exterior envelope items, and then um, you know serve the interiors as as you deem appropriate. Right. I would say nothing, really nothing that um, is included in priority one is any kind of cosmetic work, so to speak. It's really all uh, <laughs> sort of things that are unglamorous and that people don't see, but really contribute to the overall health of the building. Some of the more, um, the prettier things that, that deal with the interior um, come later in the priority list, but these initial recommendations help to secure the envelope of the building and to halt some of the, the deterioration that's been taking place over time. So, and Meredith, I, if I may, um, just to enhance that a little bit, there the the front porch, um, there are some liability issues for the town, and this isn't to scare anyone, but we certainly noticed that the displacement of the the patio, the deck uh, where people walk uh, is, it could become, and in some places it is, a tripping hazard. Um, so there are some some real issues there that uh, should be addressed. Um, the other uh, potential issue is that when the stage is used, um, as the theater is used, there are ADA issues um, that have not been addressed. Uh, the fact that the stage itself is not accessible and the dressing rooms are not technically accessible and, and there's no direct route, uh, accessible route from the dressing rooms to the stage um, doesn't currently comply with the ADA. Um, the, the auditorium itself is uh, doesn't comply with the ADA because of um, uh, the seating and the way it's arranged. Uh, you technically can get into the building through the elevator uh, on the right side um, but there's there's not a lot of access beyond that, and I'm only speaking of the the public use on the on the first floor. Obviously, the offices above are uh, accessed from the elevator, so that that works fairly well. Um, so there are a couple of issues that you know, we're not we're not lawyers, um, so we don't we don't try to grapple with that issue. But we do know the um, the ADA issues and the sort of safety issues of things like the portico. Um, that should be uh, at least looked at uh, critically uh, from the town's perspective. Uh, and if you decide not to do it, then then um, you need to understand what that means. Your question? Alita, um, I apologize since I'm new. Um, I was wondering if you have an idea of how much the, the preservation preservation funds and other grants you've been looking into, how much that would alleviate in terms of the costs, if you have a sense? Um, I know that <laughs> there are a bunch of federal grants, but the Preservation Trust of Vermont does have a good chunk of money, but it requires the town, and it's not them, it's the town to put an easement on the building. And the easement is, uh, basically a 35 year agreement and the easement committee I've met with, um, which is basically, can you be good stewards? It ensures stewardship. So if, if we decide or the town decides to, to work with them, then, um, you know, 10 years from now, someone wanted to take the pillars off or historical features and, and the, Actually, the 1929 addition included going to the pillars, and it used to be a flush front. Um, then you, 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 we would have to fight with them to say, we really want to take those pillars off. Having said that, um, ADA access generally trumps historical features. The back of the building, the 1929 addition, is a box. Mm -hmm. There are no real historical features there. 
I would just say that the uh, uh, select board should should contact the Preservation Trust of Vermont, look into easements because it does open um, not only grants from them, but also federal grants. Um, it, 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 it ensures stewardship of the building. But you don't have a sense of like how much in relation to the cost that we're talking about. Today. Um, uh, Phil? Um, Phil, would you mind coming up if you speak just so people online can hear? Thank you. Uh, Philip Newberg, I'm on the uh, Town Hall Building Committee. Um, typically, the federal grants are 50% um, of the cost, but the cost could be, the, the town's portion could be um, in kind services. So it doesn't have to be all cash contributions on the part of the recipient. But just just so you know, Laura, Phil works for the feds. He's like the highest end of the historical preservation. I, I work in this area, so I am aware of funding sources. And typically, it's about 50%. Um, but a lot of communities throughout Vermont have really leveraged these quite well. Towns even smaller than Woodstock. So Paulette is one that comes to mind. Um, there's a lot of great success stories. And I know one of our committee members who I think is online tonight, he had actually met with the state officials who handle a lot of the village development grants and the historic preservation grants. So there's a whole slew of them that we can drill down to on the next level once we have the sort of endorsement in terms, as Alita said, of, yeah, this is, this is a good approach to go forward with without committing to actual dollars at this point. Would you be able to, I'm oh, sorry, would you be able to um, send us some of the towns that have used? Yeah, yep. I guess. you can go on the Preservation Trust of Vermont website. There are, I believe, in the state of Vermont, at least 400 buildings that are under easement. And some had, um, had to do ADA access for elevators, which took out some of the historical features because the access was so important. I had two questions. Um, the grants that you're talking about, how many of them are sensitive to the um, grant list values of the town? I find Woodstock is often not in the running for grants because we're considered to be a wealthy town. I don't think that plays into this. It might for other reasons, but not in preservation. And then I was also wondering if we know how much is left from the previous fundraising campaign. How much money? So we have uh, the town is holding um, restricted funds, and actually, I meant to. The, we have a new person um, who replaced Zoe, so I didn't get to him. We have for Pentangle one hundred fifty thousand. All of that money, and I believe it may be another three hundred thousand, but those funds. Um, Obviously, as you know, I have to go back and say if the town were like, oh, we would like to do X, Y, and Z, I would go to each individual donor and say, are you comfortable with that money going toward whatever? So there is money. I mean, it's not a lot of money. It's not the million dollars we need. But there are, there are funds that people committed. Um, the big money that um, we brought in, I wouldn't say I brought in, I would say Wendy did a great job, Wendy Spector did a great job. Most of those big donors have since pulled their money back. So we don't have that huge pop, but we have, a, we have a good amount of money that I could go back to donors and say, if the select board said, hey, if we could just do, all right, deal with the fact that we don't have a, a ramp anymore. We, yeah, so a loaded ramp, if you go to, go into the theater to the outside, the only way people can, people with disabilities can come in right now is through the elevator. If the elevator doesn't work, we are not accessible because we no longer have a ramp. Um, ramps are not that expensive. Um, and I think to Susan's um, question, that, that may be sufficient to get to the next step, which the architects brought up, which is basically um, with a green light to develop the design, 
to a level where there's an accurate cost estimate yeah, um, yeah. that isn't just a conceptual cost estimate, which was which is what we have now. So that's kind of what I think the committee is looking at getting that next level, so we we know concretely what the costs might be. Yeah. It's, as anyone knows, the construction market in the last few years has been all over the place, but I think some of it's settling down now. The architect can probably speak more to that. Ready? do you have a question? Yeah, um, the estimated cost, is that, I'm assuming there's gonna be an additional cost for construction documents and, and specs and everything. Do we have an idea what that cost is to get to construction documents? We haven't done a proposal for any specific scope of services um, because it, it hasn't been determined what that scope of services is based on these priorities. So we, do, we don't have that number. Um, generally, when we budget these projects, the soft costs, and I think that's mostly what you're talking about, um, which would be fees and permits and um, any legal accounting services, anything that's ancillary to the project that makes it go, um, anywhere from 15 to 25 percent can be lumped on top we don't know what's fairly typical for town projects but you know 20 percent would be a a reasonable number uh, to budget at this point are there are other questions from the board or do you want to go to public how, yeah. how, do, how do we know we need underpinning is, what, has there been a soil test done? Yeah, there were two there were two yeah so we know that it's settling or that the ground underneath is not it solid. The building has separated what is the <coughs> exact amount, three inches from the addition to the original. Right, but it has not moved. We have um our previous um our predecessors engaged uh one of the foremost structural so engineers. So and, incredible. and we do have crack monitors. Um, and so we definitely can see, and uh, looking at the history of not only this building, but if you go down the street, we're actually not moving as much as the buildings are, the houses, right? Okay. The so, other thing they pointed out was a lot of the settlement of the rear end occurred very early, like 60, 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, are we, with the underpinning, are we able to lift back up or just stabilize? where it's at. I'm going to let the architects address that. I think they looked at um, pinning the building uh, with diagonal torquing. Yeah, there, there would be a couple of different things. One is uh, helical piles, which are, are placed under or next to the existing foundations uh, which go down to solid ground. Um, and that helps stabilize. You really can't lift things back up and into place. You just try to sort of stabilize uh, and, and then you fill the gaps uh, in a, an appropriate manner. Um, some of the other things that have been recommended, in, and it's in these in this list that you're seeing on your screen, um, are serving to stabilize the top of the building um, because there's a there's a diaphragm action uh, with the roof and the walls, and that that diaphragm is not solid right now. So adding some additional beams and providing some additional uh, roof decking would help to stabilize that even further. And, and Greg and Laura, if you ever want a tour of the building, because the top of the building is actually the original roof of the opera house and there are trusses up there. And I think what Michael is referring to is if you don't secure that, you're not securing the rest of the building. Right. So the option is either secure, sounds like to me, secure what's there or tear it off in well, time. But happen, yeah. you're tearing off a lot. I mean, not just the end, but yeah. It's an old building. It was yeah. built in 1900. Yeah. Uh, no other questions. We can go uh, yeah. John, then Roger, then Karim, if that works. So, John, you want to go first? Sure. Um, thanks. I, I, um, I've made this comment before, but I think as we get to a point where you really need to make a decision about spending money, I would urge the select board to consider it again. The, this, I think, is a great piece of work. If we decide that we want to preserve the town hall as the place to perform the three functions that it currently performs, I can't. I'm, I have confidence that this is the right plan. It's a $14 million plan. 
And if we make the commitment to the preservation trust that we will be good stewards of the building and we want to have the things that are in here, which are all perfectly reasonable, nothing in here is excessive, you know, in, in the four in the in the four phases. This is basically making a building that is the building that we would want without going overboard. We should plan on the 14 million ish. Obviously, Phil is right. There's, uh, you know, that's a, a conceptual estimate, plus maybe a little bit more, Michael, for soft costs if those are not included. Uh, the, the There is some sense of urgency. And so, you know, at least asking for a proposal of what the construct of what the next phase would cost and giving it a scope, maybe giving us some options seems like a very reasonable thing to ask since we haven't asked for it. And I think that it's very feasible that we go ahead. It's very possible that we go ahead with this, but I think it would be irres highly irresponsible to do so to actually spend a lot of money, certainly 3.3 million, without at least a cursory examination of what the other options are. The committee was not asked to do that, so I'm not faulting the committee, but the select board needs to ask someone to spend at least a few months to, for example, go and have a conversation with Gail Devine at the rec center, as I did, and ask whether or not they would be willing to, you know, engage with the town on creating a 225 seat theater in a structurally sound building, which is already ADA accessible, and with 2,000 square feet of potential office space right upstairs, to which she was quite open for that conversation. And someone should go to the school committee and ask what the size of the theater is. My understanding is that we are about to build a public space that is considerably larger and more modern and structurally sound than the town hall. I, I'm not trying to indicate that those are better ideas. They, they're unexplored ideas, but with a four, with $14 million, eventually $14 million investment to make this building, again, not extravagant, but what it should be, what we all would like to see it be. We need to ask the question of whether or not the new theater that we're about to build in the high school and the existing theater that we have that could be renovated is a better or worse option than renovating this. And I can imagine any of those answers being the right ones, including this one. And if, if this is the right answer, we have a good plan for how to proceed. But at least in parallel, appoint someone or ask this committee to do two things at once. First, get a proposal from our colleagues here as to what the next steps would cost and what it would cost to do the drawings. But at the same time, let's just at least have a cursory examination of what else we could do and what the pros and cons of that would be. To not do that is irresponsible in my view. Thanks. John, I'll just say that I have talked with the high school and I think you know and I know um, that 90% of the programming for Pentangle and okay, forget Pentangle, 90% of the work that we do is during the school year, which cannot be done on school property. I don't know that. I, I know that the 90% is correct. I know that you do a huge amount. I don't know that it can be done on school property. It may not be able to be, but I don't know that. Yeah, so I, I don't think we have a back and forth on whether the school right. is a good right. option. I yeah. think John's point is yeah. taken that That's we should right. look at other options and that'll be yeah. from the select board. Uh, Roger, you. do you wanna? Uh, yeah, I wanna echo what John just said, we're asking to make a commitment ultimately to a very large project that's going to cost a very large amount of money in a town that has severe capital needs that need to be met. There are a number, this plan makes perfect sense to me as a layperson, um, but it's making a whole bunch of a priori assumptions that I don't think we've ever decided on. I don't think we've made a decision about whether or not we need a theater the way the theater is, is currently constructed or c constituted. I don't think we've made enough, we haven't looked enough at what are the functions that need to happen in this building? What are the things that we can do to mitigate without without going and, and committing to a long-term plan to spend probably tens of millions of dollars to, to fix something that may not ultimately be worth fixing. So I think before, and, and you know, I agree with John, we should go ahead and get a project plan based on, on these priorities. But I think these priorities are being assumed without enough discourse about where 
we need to be what what is the best value added for the town to doing any work on this building or looking at other community facilities or whatever else i don't think we know i don't think we're ready to make that kind of commitment which won't just be for the 3.1 million because then next once it's sunk cost you're going to move on to the next one and again we're talking about are we going to have to suddenly jump in and take over the water system what what gigantic costs are coming down the pike and is this something that we can decide without having really looked at all of the functional options that do or do not involve making this building what it was in 1929 or whatever else thank you so i am um, oh i don't know how to ask to speak okay who's this uh lisa lawler and hey, steve one it's uh crimson waiting for a while then we'll get to you oh hold on a second here i am hi hi can you hold on one second is it okay no, please. is it I okay want, i just want Karim to go first if you mind just hold on for one second Someone else sure is, okay go ahead yeah thanks um eric um so so i would like to first make a comment that echoes uh some of what Roger said, which is something that, you know, I've been advocating for for a few years, which is each time we look at a major expense, we, we really, uh, we really should encourage ourselves to get into the habit of putting it as part of the larger picture. Okay, what are all the other bigger plans? Okay, so that people keep in mind that we're not talking an isolation project by project. Okay, we have a number of things hitting us. As I always said, all the chickens are coming to roost at the same time. Okay, so, so, so that's one. The second question I have is um, getting access to the the grants, um, the federal grants, the, the the preservation trust. Does that automatically mean that we need to go through the other parts of that plan, or potentially? Uh, would it cover half of the cost to just do the priority one and then assess if we want to move forward? No, it's not contingent on anything. Okay, thank you. So so, so there's a possibility to quote unquote, save the building without necessarily having to go through everything else. So you can sell it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like for example, I mean, I don't know, it could be just to continue using it for at least the foreseeable future in, in a safe fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lisa, do you want to go? Yeah, hi. Um, I apologize for interrupting. Um, you know, I keep hearing that the school is going to be built. No one's made any decision about that. No one's voted about it. No one's really talked about it. So I don't think that the school should be part of any conversation, the new high school. And um, I've also heard they're discussing a bond issue, but that also has not been seen. So I do have to say for Alita to thank you for discussing these things in advance. And I'm hoping that soon, I'm hoping that the select board reaches out to the high school committee, whoever they are, and ask them to start to discuss this because we're heading towards the season where we start hearing bonds. and. We can't afford all this. I mean, we all know that, you know, we have a water company, we have a sewer problem, we have the building, we have the high school. And I'm hoping that I'm asking that you guys reach out to that committee and then start to come to the select board and discuss this because we're hearing more, you know, this is only one part of what people want to see this year. So I'm asking, you know, could that be taken up as a conversation? Um. So thank you. I'll just really for the people in the room that uh, the school uh, committee operates independently from the municipal government. Uh, uh, so we don't have really any say over what happens um, when it comes to any conversation about building a school or not building a school. Um, I will say the select board and the trustee board have been in contact with the school committee and the superintendent uh, over the course of summer about these issues. Uh, but any questions going to the school should be directed to the school committee. I, I, and I understand that, but it is the responsibility of the citizens, of the voters and the taxpayers of this town to to pay for the project. So, yep. 
if we don't know what the project is going to be or how it's going to be funded, how it doesn't matter if it's private or public, this turns to the responsibility of each taxpayer of the supervisory yeah. union. All right, thank you. So many Eva. Yeah, Joe, say, say your name and. Yeah, Rich Kozlowski, um, South Road. I'm um, a member of the committee. And John brought up, you know, a, a valid point on what other options there are in place of what some of the functions are of this building. But keep in mind, if we said tomorrow there are no functions in this building, this building still belongs to the taxpayers of Woodstock. And the what is included in phase one is is not when it's when phase one is paid for and finished and you drive by the building you're not gonna be like man look at what, all the work they did you're not gonna see anything this is all structural stuff we are still going to be owners of a building that needs this work this is not anything that is grandiose this is merely just to stabilize what we have and i want to praise the architects because they did a great job that was one of the first things we asked <laughs> prioritize what needs to be done today, what are the costs of those things, and then what, as time goes on, if we chose to do those things, what are the other phases of the project and how will that affect the taxpayers? But immediately, right now, if we stop doing anything in this building tomorrow, we still own a building that has a ton of $3 million worth of deferred maintenance to keep it structurally sound. So that just to keep that in perspective. Thank you. Uh, so I think Jill Davies has a hand up and then Chief Green, you want to, yeah. so Jill. Hey, so, um, hello. So I was a member of the prior town hall committee and I've worked for many years on energy in the building. So I think I know the building quite well. I'm just really, I want to support what everybody else has been saying that I'm extremely worried that we are thinking of spending 1.6 million on part of the building that we're not absolutely convinced we want to keep in the future and that's all i want to say because otherwise it would be repetitious thanks Jill. Uh, chief green uh david green so i was on this committee and, and uh I, I am very much in love with this building and always have been and unfortunately you guys have inherited the past sins of previous select boards um, i keep hearing that we should move or investigate other areas to go I don't think it's wise. This is our building. We own it free and clear. It has some problems, but I think if we were to do, do a phased approach, get this building repaired, the envelope, not look at other buildings or let this die in committee for another four years, that we fix the building and keep Pentangle here, because in my mind, this building doesn't work with Pentangle. And it also doesn't work with town hall. We work cohesively together. We pay bills together. And if they were to go somewhere else, like the high school or the rec center, now we're stuck paying what they pay for rent, what they pay repairs for repairs. So, I mean, I would ask that we move forward tonight with finding fund funding for a construction budget, see where it goes, and maybe bring it up for a special article in the future, very near future. We do have several bonds expiring in the next three or four years. I'm well aware of the sewer plant and the water issues, but I think if we all pull together, we can make this work. We're not asking for this building to be repaired next year or um, phase two to be done next year or three years. This in our minds is a 25 year project, but let's stabilize the building, make it safe. If the heat were to crap out tomorrow, you're going to be running trailers for employees to do their work, moving computer systems, which is a waste of $200,000 per year. So you try to find funding for a heating system that we were making aware needed to be replaced. And I get, I really get it. It's a hard decision, but it's really something you should think about and maybe let voters take a whack at it. Thank you. Uh, could you could you please come up front so we can hear you? This this is Woodstock's town hall. Talk about the schools. 
is the whole uh, Windsor, well, was Windsor. It's not just Woodstock, it's several other towns. So we can't assume that this is going to be approved by all these other towns, and we don't control that from Woodstock. But this is our town hall, and this we control. And if necessary maintenance has been put aside for too long, it's your home. You take care of your home. So I hope that you will support it as it functions right now. And thank you. So, any, any other questions, I guess? Um, any comments? Discussion? Yeah. This has been shy. Um, one of my, I think I, I echo what John and Roger have talked about, and one of my concerns is that we are, um, through this, making a decision without a lot of investigation. And I'm concerned when I hear, well, there's also problems with leaking windows and roofing and leaking within the building, yet the $3 million doesn't address any of that. So I feel like we this is making that if we approve this, we're making a decision prematurely. That's well, I, I, I do think that the envelope issues are addressed. Correct. Yeah, and, and those are very readily achievable grant items like the windows and so forth. Well, we don't have a proposal for construction documents, correct? Right. So, I mean, that would be the first thing we'd need. And I would also, I, I echo what Susan and John said, that we should look at other options. Just to look. Doesn't say we have to do them, but, you know, does it make sense to sell a building to a developer? Nobody shoot me, please. Um, well, and, that, that's, and, on, that's on you all to do No, that. but I'm just saying, uh, you know, that's an option. Look at that. Can we go to the Sheriff's Department, for instance, that has a building there that's probably only used 10% of it? I don't know, but we. I think we need to have options and not just say, this is the only way we can go. That, I think we're good with that. I think, you know, this is our best effort to say, we've done our due diligence to mm -hmm. say, this is what the status of the building is right now. And it's now in the select board to go and say, okay, look at the other options. And then you can say, um, I, I, I will say, and I think, for those of us that are from here, this is the largest public space in Woodstock. It is a destination um, for people to come. I think I'm more of Chamber of Commerce than I am Pentangle, but you all know that. I mean, you know that. So you can look at the options and you can weigh the decisions. Do you want to take this building down? And gosh knows in the history of this building, it's happened three times where the town has been faced with, do we save this building? And it's, yeah, I think the purpose of our committee is now to say to you all, go for it. Do your research, do your, look at your options. I, I would offer, um, based on what I heard tonight, that um, we could request of the um, design team a proposal uh, for the fees associated with creating the next, which would be really a schematic design. I think is that right, my, Michael? Assume you're still on. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can come back right now. We've got nothing except for what it's going to cost. Right. No, and and that's an estimate. And right. They're never right. So. Well, I think they get finer and finer, right? They get closer get more and closer. Yes. Yeah. But but I think it's it's fair to say would we send them out to do that when you want to go an exploratory mission, which is well within your purview. So um, I, we could do it simultaneously. What do well, the construction a, documents do? Do they give us a, an idea what this is going to stay at in different phases? Well, for phase one, it'll be, it'll be a finer tune estimate based on, so when they did this, of course, there's inflation. Um, and they did have a professional cost estimator. Yeah. So, so the greater level of detail that the 
uh, design team has to give the cost estimate or the finer the cost estimate is going to be. Um, so I don't know that we get the construction documents after everything I heard tonight. It sounds like what we should do is get to a schematic or design development cost. Would you agree, Michael? That's probably- I, I would, yeah. And, and you, know, you can take this as you take construction in a phased way, you can take the design in a phased way, um, right. do the schematic design, get the, the better level of detail, uh, a more finely tuned estimate, um, and then decide what to do from there. Um, you can go to the parallel, next to be designed. Right, to parallel with that, they can undertake these other steps that were mentioned tonight. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and there's no, except for 35 years with the in stewards for the building. For the, I mean, you know, we need more information than just 50 years. 50, whatever, 100, for, doesn't for matter. About 50 yet. years. Um, but, you know, we need more, more information. We just can't. Well, and if you're interested, and we brought this before the select board before, if you're interested in the terms of the easement on the building for Preservation Trust of Vermont and other federal grants, we can surely give you that. Yeah. Our, our dear question? Yeah, I, I, that was, Ray was speaking to the point. I think I have more questions about what the easement would look like and the details associated with it. Because, yeah, I. It sounds like the committee has some homework. Yep. Yeah estimate together from the design firm for the next phase of services and also to um, alert you to grant opportunities that are there and then what some of the easement terms, uh, what the easement terms would be. And I think so we can come back next month or December. To yeah. yeah. I, I guess I'm wary that we're, we're sending you to do more work um, without kind of getting at the core of the issue which is that we don't have consensus on what the use of this building is and should be. And I don't know how to solve that. Good point. That's a very good point. And I, I think I, David spoke to that though. Yeah. In absence of yeah, someone but, else. But, uh, but is... I think it's, it is the select board. It right. is on you to huddle and talk about that. Right. We can certainly go do our research you can go look at options and with John Spector and Jill and whatever. Um, but I think ultimately <laughs> it's, it's, I hate to say it, but it's on the select board to make a decision. Uh, we're just a committee. We can give you more information on fundraising, okay. but um, you are the decision makers. And I think the, the point or the main point is there's no decision the board needs to make tonight. Right. You know, they, you can, uh, you can ask them nothing to be done and ask them tomorrow to do something as well. So I think if uh, you're worried about putting them on a search that ends nowhere, we can take a beat and talk in a week and decide what we actually what, what those questions may be for the committee to, to research. If you want to look at other options, who do that work as well? Um, there's no need for the board to make any votes tonight if they're not comfortable or have a consensus on where they want to go. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that makes sense. We okay. had talked about maybe trying to form a working committee as well yeah. around this issue. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. And next up is meeting schedule discussion. Um, so this came up. Uh, Currently, the board is scheduled to meet uh, the first Tuesday of every month at 10 a.m. and then the third Tuesday every month at 6 p.m. Um, conversation came up of whether or not to change the time of the Tuesday meeting uh, or maybe then even uh, eliminate the, the first Tuesday meeting, go to one meeting a month uh, for the time being. Um, I think the chair and I talked, and I think the idea we kicked around was with potential for a lot of budget meetings in the next few months, along with special meetings for God knows what comes up, um, was to trial doing one meeting a month until uh, a town meeting in March, and then have whatever the new board is after that vote on going forward. Uh, so that was one proposal we talked about, but I think we can open up to a discussion of the board uh, and what the board thinks about keeping the status quo, 
going to one meeting, changing the time of the first day meeting. I think we have a, a discussion on that if everyone wants to. So the option before, so keeping as we do now, an um, evening meeting and a day meeting, changing the time and going down to one meeting. I mean, the options really are anything. I mean, this kind of, yes. it's not a multiple choice. It's, it's more fill, it's more fill in the blank. So it's just, I mean, those are, that's how the progression happened. Okay. Uh, so, but I mean, in front of the board now, I have a discussion on how yes. you want to proceed. We didn't have any some. We didn't have any uh, ten o'clock meetings in the summer. That's, I, I feel like we always seem to have a special meeting thrown in, and I personally like the predictability. I don't like. I think ten o'clock is a brutal time. Um, <laughs> not because I'm asleep, just because it chops up the middle of the day. Um, it's okay if you are, Susan. <laughs> no, I like the predictability of for both the board and the public in general of having a set meeting. If we have, if we don't have anything to discuss, we can always cancel it. But um, it, it, when we schedule meetings on 48 hours notice, I don't think it gives people a lot of time to plan to be here. And I also don't, I don't wanna have two night meetings. I don't think it's fair to have staff and our, and our manager have to work that many nights. I, I like the idea of a four o'clock meeting on, on the other Tuesday. But I, I just think it's easier to have the set meetings and if we find we can, we can cancel it, then we can cancel it. But that's my opinion. I like to swap myself. Yeah, actually, I, I but for a couple of reasons, I think it, it's better for the public to attend. Um, even at four, I mean, 10 o'clock, unless somebody's really interested in something, nobody shows up to the meetings. And four o'clock, a lot of people are either still working or getting home from work. If we're going to have a second meeting, I would schedule it for six o'clock. And I know that puts more stress and work on, on you folks, but I just think if we're going to have a public meeting, let's make sure that the public can attend. Yeah. And we can decide, well, if we would know ahead of time if we have if we items it, right. for the agenda. Yeah. Have we ever not? Had a meeting because we didn't have an agenda. Yeah, I think recently we we canceled oh. the last Tuesday yeah. meeting, okay. um, and then I think we canceled that one in September when I was on was on vacation yes. or something. Yeah. We canceled it as well, or we had uh, I think we had to have a special meeting for some some reason. Um, so yeah. So normally it's been twice a month. So, so it's been twice a month uh, with one day meeting. Well, so I, I think it was like three years ago. It was two night meetings, and they moved it to one. No, day actually, meeting. it was just one night meeting. Then at the, the select board at the time decided that they thought they needed a second meeting for the day. Okay. And that's where that came from. And then we went, and that's been like that for, I think, a couple of years. Well, since we have, I see Jill has her hand up, and since we have yes. the few people that actually attend our meetings, we should ask them. Jill? So, so the second meeting, was only added when we had when we didn't have a town manager or we had an interim town manager. We always used to just have one meeting plus special meetings during the budget or if there was something really urgent to discuss. Two meetings is not the norm. It's been through this extraordinary time we've had in the last five years. Special meetings that we had. Oh, don't. <laughs> So, I mean, this, this, this is part of it. I think we've had special meetings just because sometimes just to have them. Yeah. I think it's, we're talking about having a better structure about uh, how to plan for meetings and hopefully that'll end some of those special meetings. Um, but uh, this is my 10th month, 11th, uh, ninth, ninth month. And there's probably been at least five or six special meetings. I know between the like, board and the trustees combined. I know when I was, before I was on the select board and I was attending the night meetings, they would sometimes go three hours and more. And I thought that was also another reason why the other meeting was added, just because nobody, you know, people really didn't want to be here till nine o'clock at night. But at, at that time, I think they also just put things on the agenda because people wanted things on the agenda. And I think if we can control the agenda better, I mean, there's some things that'll come up at the last minute that are, that are an emergency, but you know, I think if we can control the, the agenda better, I would prefer one. But if we do two, I would 
for it at six o'clock. Could we try this two six o'clock meetings until town meeting? And we could just cancel them. I will just say um, there is confusion from the public when we do cancel meetings as well. It's, it's kind of inverse because people are planning on it. Then the way we get the word out is a normal list or Facebook and people aren't seeing that. I've had I've had people show up day of a meeting thinking there was going to be a meeting and you can't reach everyone. So it it it, it creates the other, the other issue of people expecting a meeting and then you cancel it. They wonder why you cancel it. So I just want to make that to the board as well. Do we need two meetings a month? I think that's one of the questions in front of the board right now. There's some who think yes, some who think no. So <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm too young on this to answer that. I would say at least the one meeting, and I agree, a set time is better for the public to get used to mm -hmm. when they can come. Myself, I like six o'clock, but if a special meeting has to be called, then it could be any time. Yeah. Um, but people need to get here. Yeah. Need to be able to have the time to be here. I so I if I could summarize, I think the four board members tonight agree that six p.m. is probably the best time for a meeting. So the next question is: Is it one meeting a month, or is it one scheduled meeting a month, or two scheduled a month? Is probably the next decision to be made. I'm fine with one. I don't know about anyone else. It's it's always it's easier to go to two if we need them. If we if the next couple of months show that we really are here till the end of the night, till nine eight thirty nine o'clock, then I then I'll I have no problem going to a second meeting. That's crucial. I just don't want to be here till you know. No, I, I, I yeah. spread the agenda out yeah. over two yeah. meetings to be different for everyone. That's fine by me too. I think you can do what makes your life easier. <laughs> it's hard enough to do this and get wrapped up by people like me. <laughs> Project. So, you know, personally, I prefer the heat because it doesn't cut into my work day, um, and I think it's more accessible to the public. Personally, I would suggest that you go to one meeting right now, because I think the two meetings is really kind of a, a COVID project where you really need to be on top of things. Um, so, and if you need to go to two, you, you go to two. But again, I would do, if 10 o'clock works better for the people at this table than do 10 o'clock, whatever I do. So, uh, I think my memory is Two meetings came about because there are not regular scheduled special meetings every fall uh, because there were a lot of items that couldn't wait for 30 days after the meeting. Okay. That needed to be selected. It didn't happen all the time, but it just happened. Enough. Yeah. Special meeting for, for your second meeting to a special meeting. And I mean, if I could, I think. Uh, if we're going to try something new and potentially have one meeting, there will be special meetings happening in the next for the for the budget. So it could be a time to experiment saying if we realize that in these special budget meetings we have to hack on select board stuff because there's a time limit. We're gonna have those meetings anyways. So that's good that's a good thing. Um so that'd just be another point I I'd I'd put throw it there as well. Oh. All right, so okay. we all agree one night. One meeting at six o'clock and then special for the budget. Yeah. yeah, and do you, I guess the other thing that we have some kind of agreement, do you want to still have the third week or the third or not the first? Because you have both. No, third, yeah, the third. third. Okay. Does that make sense from your schedule with the trustees and everything? Yeah, trustees the second week, so it makes sense. And I think we can kind of hold the first Tuesday open if we need to have something. But you know what you said anyway, so okay. Okay. So I think you guys want to vote on it. All right. Your motion. I'll make a motion to move the select board meetings to the first Tuesday. Third, 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 third Tuesday, Tuesday at third, six. Third Tuesday of the month at six p.m. And not have the 
second and, reading on the first. Yes, and not have a second reading on the first. Is there a second? I second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That was your first motion. Congratulations. <laughs> Me and Grant. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Okay. We'll have that moment, yeah, when yeah. she retires in 50 years, we'll give it we'll give her the minutes from this. Yeah. All right. The bits. Mark. Mark. What? So I think uh traditionally we uh go to bid for these different uh, projects. Uh we did that. So we have attached is D and D. Uh, our recommendation for the screen sand would be for them. Uh, the three eighths sand for Pike. Uh, the gravel for Pike as well. Yes. And then the diesel for Dead River. Would be the recommendations from Mark and myself after reviewing the bids and going through them uh, for the best price and the best service for the um, municipality. Any questions? So the sand is not just D and D; it's the manufactured sand with mixed with it, like you have been doing. No, D and D is screen sand, and then the three eighths um, are stone. So we blend oh, it yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, the back roads. So it's the same as you've been doing. Yes. Yep. Okay. We accept the bid. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, up next, uh, I got asked by um, Rick, correct? Um, from the SBA to kind of just present what the SBA is uh, available uh, to do for local businesses. Uh, so he asked for five minutes, uh, just people uh, who still may need help from um, the flood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ready, <my wing>. yeah. <laughs> so, thanks for the opportunity. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So I came here for multiple reasons. We are still here in the field. Uh, the latest, uh, the most updated information is that FEMA and SBA we extended their deadlines for the second time until October 31st. Um, the closest of uh, DRC, the DRC is the Disaster Recovery Center. Those are from FEMA, but we were there too. Uh, the people can apply there with the SBA, with FEMA, no obligation of benefits. Uh, and that's in Ludlow, in the main street. So that, uh, that's the most, uh, that's the closest. So uh, always, but the 800 number is very important because they can answer all the questions there. They can give the status of the applications on the homeowners uh, flyer, uh, 800-659-2955. That number is very important. So this paper is for procedures, uh, but uh, I also came because uh, we, we are visiting the Chamber of Commerce. I'm glad the emergency management director is here too the media, the select boards, the town managers to help us to reach the most people as possible, sharing the information that, because that's what we want to, to do, to reach the most uh, survivors or citizens that are affected the most people as possible. That's our priority. Uh, the people is taking advantage of this. We have approved more than 20 million. Uh, so the main differences between FEMA, SBA, and USDA, we don't provide funds for uh, the um, for public assistance for the government. We only provide funds for businesses, homeowners, renters, and nonprofits. Uh, USDA they pr they provide funds for public assistance too, and they provide uh, funds for homeowners repairs and businesses repair too. Uh, FEMA they provide individual assistance and public assistance, but we don't provide uh, funds for government. You all know that FEMA is grant free money. But uh, the people get discouraged with us because we are low interest rate loan from the federal government. But that's that's why we visit and we inform about us. It's not only general information. Uh, that's why I'm here too to explain how the people can use these and take advantage of these funds, even though 
that uh, they call these loans, but they are many uh, kind loans. I explain how some people use these in their advantage. For example, some people that have insurance, they might they might get the money faster with us because the purpose is to to recover, to uh, rebuild quicker, faster, instead of waiting for the payment or settlement for months or a year or more with the insurance company. That's one way because we have the one year deferment with 0% interest rates, no nothing that year, the interest rate don't increase and you don't have to pay nothing for that year. That's why they do that. Also, uh, if FEMA denies you, uh, we come into play. If, uh, if FEMA give you funds but are not enough, for example, that denegation letter is very important because the people can attach that for the application of FEMA. If FEMA gave you 20, 30,000 or the, the maximum that is 41, that if, if they gave you that is because you were totally flooded, you flooded, you lost everything. So, but if let's say that you receive less, 10, 20, 30,000, and you are not satisfied, and they refer you to SBA, you can put that denegation letter because the grounds are there, why, why they are denying you. You put that uh, uh, like um, as grounds for the appeal. So that's another way. Uh, I always recommend on times of disaster to always supply with everything because you never know from what part are you going to get the money faster. With uh, Red Cross, Salvation Army, with all kind of assistance, federal assistance, state assistance. Uh, we also have a resource partner for businesses. That's the SBDC, a small business development center. All the counties have a business advisor. That means that we give them funds and the state too, so they work for both, for the federal agency and for the state, and they are helping with all these applications. They know about USDA, SBA, FEMA. They are helping with the application of the state, so they are a very um, valuable resource. I think that the name of, of because I be, I visited uh, that um, uh, building, but I think that they are not there anymore in Springfield. They, they had the office. I think that the name is Debra. Uh, the uh, Jera uh, a small business development center here for Windsor County. So that's a very good uh, resource for businesses. I always, as a general rule, the businesses, homeowners, renters, and nonprofits register fair with FEMA. But the issue is that, for example, with businesses, they don't provide funds for businesses. So they, uh, but they need to register, register fair with FEMA because. FEMA give them a number that we need that for our application. So they are going to refer the businesses to SBA anyways. But the exception is that the businesses can apply directly uh, with the SBA. That's very uh, important to know. Uh, here is the fact sheet of the uh, USDA. You know that they have a part a far for farmers, a part for rural development. So. Also, uh, here is a flyer for homeowners, um, renters, and businesses, nonprofits for US for SBA. Um, here is the flyer that I was talking uh, about the US uh, SBA resource partners. Here is the uh, link sba.gov slash local assistance. That means that we have uh, resource partners for women, veterans, uh, everything is related to businesses. And SBDC is so important. It's, it's very important too because they know about marketing, business uh, plans. They, they can help the businesses with any kind of topic. They are a very good resource, the SBDC. So, yeah. And um, also, right now we don't have, we, we had a BRC in Mullo too. That's a business recovery center from SBA, but that's already closed. Mm -hmm. No, no anymore uh, BRCs in the entire. Uh, declaration of Vermont, the presidential declaration. So um, also, uh, I give another advice um, because always the people get discouraged with us, but nothing nothing to get discouraged because no fee supply, the people don't have to accept that they can ask for less, they can ask for more. I always say uh, this example, when FEMA denies you and most of the time they refer for, this is for homeowners or renters, they refer them to SBA. Uh, because they want to know, because we were jointly, they want to know if a person, if that person really uh, can pay for a loan. They, that, they, it's like a financial verification process. So that's why they send the, the citizens, the survivors to SBA. So if you are denied by FEMA and then referred to SBA and you are denied by SBA, SBA might refer you back to FEMA and FEMA might give you all the other disaster assistance like grants. It's not guaranteed, but at least the people can have hope to receive something. I always explain that. Even though if you don't want it, if you don't qualify, 
apply complete the procedures because once again that denegation letter is the evidence to apply with other kind of resources or agencies or nonprofits. You know what I mean? So always it's important to complete the procedures with the SBA. Because we look the last thing, we we are not the best option, but we are for some people we are the only option or um, best option. And to summarize, we are an alternative. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your Thank you. Wastewater update. Yeah. Um, so I believe we have a meeting scheduled next week uh, with yourself and uh, the vice chair. Um, Nobody got back to us about when. Okay. That's why I don't have it on my schedule. Um, so I had a <laughs> conversation with Hoyle Tanner, the engineering firm that the, the, the town, um, yeah, the town um, had hired. Um, to work on the main wastewater uh, renovation project. Uh, they requested a meeting with myself and the chair and the vice chair uh, to go over kind of where we're at and what they see going forward. Uh, the recommendation they're gonna make in that meeting is for <clears throat> uh, the town to push the uh, potential votes for a bond for that project into next year. Uh, it's their belief that uh, not enough has been done to have the successful vote in March. Um, and they want, they recommend us having more time to really get the word out, uh, really get public support behind it. Uh, so they're, I believe, going to recommend having a special uh, vote in November of next year, uh, along with the election, to try to get a uh, full uh, uh, vote attendance uh, on the ballot. Uh, so that means it will be next week, and then we can report back to our select board at, at that time and, and the public as well. Next week. Uh, do you know if the other? Next. This Thursday. Thursday, one o'clock. Thursday, the 19th, one o'clock. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is for the wood for the village. The main one in the village, yeah. Yeah. Is this a time sensitive? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it doesn't mean done, no, it doesn't need to be done tomorrow, um, but in a year or two, then the, the states will come down for us on new permits. So this is a state. Mandated, 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 yeah. More than an update. Yeah, so it's state mandated for some updates that need to get it done. Um, it's also uh, will, in theory, allow us to develop more in that section of town by having more capacity for sewer, uh, which is an issue we have right now. Okay. Okay. Got my calendar list. Please contract discussion. Yeah, so this is more of a, again, an update. Um, the current contract between the village and, and the town for police coverage for 40 hours a week is up uh, on June 30th, 2024, uh, which is obviously about eight months away. However, uh, with the budget season underway, um, it's important for the town and village to get together and have discussions about what's gonna happen next, because as we know, the town pays about 4,000 plus dollars to the village which is about half of their budget for the police. Uh, so if there are any changes that need to be known now so we can, <laughs> we can be ready, uh, but also I think just so we can uh, know what's gonna happen going forward. Uh, so uh, the plan is for myself and the chair and vice chair both board to get together and have a conversation. Uh, and then at that point, invite the police chief in, have a large conversation, and then hopefully have something uh, kind of Compromise or a deal at that point, and then go from there. And that's the one that, that we don't update for. That a do right. poll was sent out for yesterday. Yeah. Today. Yeah. So there's no there's no date set, but we'll get one on the calendar as soon as possible. David. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, so far enough. I I will say uh, Roger emailed us early today, and we've been going back and forth. Uh, but thank you for your email. Yeah, and I, um, I sent Eric and, and Ray an email. I have a whole bunch of questions about this contract. Um, and there may be more information that, that is not publicly available or at least easily publicly available, but I don't see where all the money is going. Um, the The village has has something like 271000 in its expense report that is – the the FTE and and a whole bunch of ancillary stuff like the car and everything else, um, 
and I don't know what adds up to the other 404,000, four, 4, 44 K, 440 K, something like that, right? Um, so I would just, as we go forward into the budget, first of all, I would encourage, you know, I know it's kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, so it's it's kind of the weird municipal structure we have here, but, <laughs> but I, I would, I would like to really look at this very, very carefully. And then I would like to have the information about where in fact the money is being spent made more publicly available and more explicit. Um, you know, I'd like to see how many on-call calls are made, how many hours are spent on on-call calls that are excessive, uh, that are excess to the 40, 40 hours a week. Um, because otherwise, as as a citizen, I just don't know where this this forty five percent of the budget is going to one FTE and one police car. There's got to be more. <laughs> so just I don't have the funding in front of me, but the basis of it, from my recollection, is there's a uh, staffing a full time officer and a few other things. Right. And then the contract states forty one percent of this cost will be paid by by the town. They'll say like uh, fuel, for example. 41% of that total cost will be paid from the town. That's where the rest of the money kind of ends up. So you have the full-time person for like $235,000, then the rest is kind of allocated at 41% to everything else. Okay, and that makes sense if that's how the, the budget spreadsheet was built for the, the village's budget. But that, if those, unless there's other money somewhere that is not reflected in the budgets, that only comes up to $271,000. Yeah. And then... But the, the contract is for four hundred and forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So I would like to know where the rest of that money is. I'm not saying that it's yeah. you know, yeah. that there's an it's just I don't know. I have no idea. And I don't know what the the value benefit of what we're getting in the town is is reflected. Yeah. Um I'm not prepared to speak to that. Of course not. I, I, you know, what I want to say is that if you wanna spend your time with me, we can go over it in my office together. I'm happy to walk through it with you with everything in front of us. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and then I'd also, I know you will, but whenever, if and when there's a new contract that we voted on, I would suggest showing up and asking those questions and make sure we have those answers for you. Yeah. And if, it would be great if we could see the contract beforehand. Or yeah. If it's going to be, if it's gonna be uh, voted on, it should be available ahead of time. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. David. Evening again. Um, so up for uh, your recommendation and approval is the MS per capita fees to our prescribing towns. Uh, there are five of them that we uh, provide EMS service to, and this is just the per capita fee to have the honor of us coming into your town. Okay, so if there is an EMS call and we pick up a patient that's billed separately and everything else. We have contracts with these towns. Yes. And are they annual or? I, I, every three years. Every three. Yes. And some of these are, are in the middle of a contract. They're all they are all the same three years. Okay. We've got them all in line. Okay. Um, they are asking some of them, which we will. We just did the three year contract last year, um, to have this. Uh, oh, I just remember we reviewed Comfort most recently. I thought, but anyway, go ahead. Um. No, I, I thought I got them all online, but anywho, uh, that this become a three year per capita fee, which I said I'd be willing to entertain if you'd only have to see me once every <laughs> three years instead of. <laughs> so presently, we we're not commit, we're not bound to the these numbers. It's just your recommendation, right? Correct. Yes, but they want in the future to have these numbers. Built into the contract, so they won't change over three years. Correct. Okay. Um, you might have answered this by answering Susan's question, David, and then I apologize. But um, so last week at the budget meeting, we talked a lot about costs increasing, especially in the fire department, between salaries and, and ambulances. So I'm wondering why the fees wouldn't increase. 
Yep. So uh, they took a huge hit when we first started this three years ago. We more than doubled what they were paying. So we're giving them a little bit of time to reel over to uh, adjust. Adjust. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yes. And I mean, I looked at it, you know, raising it 10%, that adds to $4,000. Um, is it really worth the, the, you know, the negativity that we'll get from the other towns to do that? Do you feel you can make it work for three years at this price? I guess. Yes. Okay. Well, no, that'd be in the future. Right now, this is annual. This is annual. So, but in the future, we could say on year one that we do a 5% year two, 6% or whatever we dream up. But that way, they wouldn't have to wait for this every year to get it budget cut. Oh, okay. So, which is really their end game. So this is for three years. No, no, no. no. This, this is, is yeah. that's right. Okay, yeah. that's right. We're talking about two separate things. Yeah, yeah. this oh, is okay. just for yeah. FY twenty four twenty five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. So I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're saying three. Years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We might. Yeah. I mean, I trust the guy. Right. Right. But the guy, yeah. not in yeah. the yeah. plus, plus, after what I said about Tom Hall, he's probably got you know, yeah. fire truck ready to run me over when I get in the car. <laughs> Ray, I'll never hold that against. Might be something else. Okay. Um. Do a motion. I'll move. We accept the per capita fees for the 2045 fiscal year. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Have a good night. Thank you, Chief. Up next, BDC. Thanks. The, the agenda item says a housing discussion, but there's actually three items of the housing one can go first i think the other two won't take very long um just the, the only the only intro just a one sentence intro joe if that's all right is it if you remember four months ago you all approved um three or four months ago you approved a series of uh, a second wave of housing incentives um joe can give you a brief update as to how those are going they're going very well <laughs> um but you also asked us to investigate incentives for existing landlords who have always been renting, you know, to the local workforce at reasonable rates. And that's what this topic is, um, is partly about. So Jill, go ahead. Actually, Trina's going to talk first. Oh, sorry. We're going to present these in the odd. We, we thought we'd do an easier version first. So Trina's going to talk about uh, the ADU program <clears throat> and what we think we could do there. Hello, Trina Tolliver. I'm the housing advisor for the EDC. And I'm here to present a um, an idea, if you will, um, for the new ADU and multi-unit housing. Um, has to do with tax exemption or possibly tax stabilization. Um, we think that there's an opportunity uh, to increase the supply of housing here. We'd like to get the municipality involved in building upon uh, the EDC programs that have been established, and it can be done with the taxation or exemption. So I'm here to just share that idea with you, um, and if it's something that you Bill has some teeth and you're interested and want us to move forward. Uh, the next step would be for us to consult with the Vermont leagues of cities and towns um, with the introduction that we could do so. So I think that's a municipal resource. Um, <clears throat> so right now, um, again, the issue is that the property taxes are a significant factor um, in the cost of building new units, whether it's an ADU or a home uh, near Woodstock. Um, and even expanding or improving existing needs. So it can be a deterrent for some folks to get involved in the programs that we've established just because of the property tax. And we've heard that on many occasions. And Dave Green's not here, but I think he's even alluded to it at uh, one of the prior meetings uh, this has come up. So what we'd like to do is uh, propose <clears throat> uh, this, uh, there's an opportunity for us to encourage property owners to build these. We already are giving $10,000 to the EDC. That's with the EDC 1% local option tax funds. However, when they're building these properties, their assessments are going up on the values of their property. 
Um, and in some cases, uh, say for example, you build a $200,000 ADU. Um, I put some calculations in here based off last year's tax rates. That would increase the municipal taxes for that person $1,300 a year. And the state tax based off last year's rates, $3,600 a year. So you're looking at what a $5,000 uh, increase there. Um, so basically uh, the thought is that the property tax increase that these folks are incurring to build these housing units in Woodstock, it reduces the value of our original incentive that we're giving them, the $10,000. Um, and they're building a $200,000 unit. So I've done some research and utilized some of the um, education and things I learned in the Lister's office when I was working there for three years. So we think there's an opportunity to use the exemptions or stabilization on this new development. Um, and it could be used to lower the taxes for a specified period of time for these new ADUs or multi-unit homes. Um, there are a few examples here. I'm not going to get into it, but this is a common thing used in other local governments um, across the United States. And even locally here in Vermont, there's towns that are using tax exemptions or stabilization to uh, incent development. So the first one that uh, one of the proposed solutions is to incentivize specifically for those building the smaller uh, multi-unit and ADU units. Um, we believe that it might be a good uh, opportunity to make this eligible for people that are building in the area um, on their own or those that are also involved in the EDC program. So there's two different, I guess, target audiences, if you will, that these could be uh, used for. And just to kind of give you some numbers, because I know John mentioned numbers, Right now we have uh, 15 units that are, are in play housing units, whether it's an ADU or a multi-unit um, that are in the EDC programs now since it started in June of uh, last year. So of those, <clears throat> we have 12 units that are actually um, in the uh, new dwelling, not a rental incentive, but new dwelling. So 12 of those. Um, one of the statutes that we are going to recommend is 3836. And basically with that statute, you could reduce the assessment of those properties by $75,000. Um, and it's for a set period of time, three years. And so in this case, specific to where we are now, we have uh, 12 units that this could potentially apply to. Um, so one is already rented, the others are in construction, probably uh, due in the next couple of years. But basically, you know, we are suggesting that we apply that statute to give them a little bit of a break on their uh, property tax. And we also are suggesting that eligible property owners are exempt or from paying zoning and permit fees. Mm -hmm. The other idea is to take this beyond just the ADU and multi-unit development and use it for housing development in general, um, taking it a step far further, if you will. Um, it could be for property owners who build single families or multi-family homes. Um, we could put, uh, you can define these programs for stabilization to be um, very specific uh, with a total cost, say 600,000 on page two that we're using here. Um, and those programs could be for people that live here in Woodstock that live in the home, residential homes, and or it could be for um, homes that are rented to local workers. Again, focused on the keeping it local aspect that we, if they don't live here, that they rent it to somebody who's working here. So we still get the benefit of having a local worker as part of the program and good use of this space. <clears throat> so one thing that uh, the statutes on page three, 3836 is actually an exemption that's already out there. 
Um, it's in the Lister's handbook. It's referenced there. Um, and this gives you the exact verbiage here. So, Eric, I know you had some questions. Mm -hmm. I thought I could address some of those here. If, if, yeah, if sure. you'd like. Um, um, Trina, just keep it brief because we don't want to go into the detail. We want to stay with the principle that we're not yes. asking for your authority for such a program. We're asking for your um, we're asking whether you're interested in taking this further and using a legal resource. Because we've about come to the end of our knowledge and now we need legal advice, but we don't want to incur those costs until we know that we have your enthusiastic endorsement. Right. Thank you, Jill. So the 3836 is already in statute. That's a very easy one to to work out um, as opposed to the stabilization agreement. Those are going to take a lot more work. We have to actually define and build those out. There were some examples that were in the uh, links on the document, like Highgate and some others. Um, that bird is trying to propose some stabilization agreements now as well to also incentivize housing development. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, the one that's, uh, if you're cherry picking, 3836 is already right there. And um, that one specifically on your questions, um, you'd ask some questions about how some of the things we're, we're proposing here might affect our townwide reappraisal in two years. And uh, in, in my opinion, the answer is that it would not because they're still coming in and assessing everything. All the properties are getting assessed. Whatever we do here, whether it's an exemption or the stabilization agreement, is off of that assessment. So everyone will still be reassessed and brought whole, if you will, with the values of what they put after Correct. Um, the other question you asked is uh, tracking the timelines and when these could be done. Uh, there's a portion in the handbook, and it's also in the Lister's office. It's called voted contracts. We use a couple of those in the town right now, um, but those have a beginning and end, and the statute that they're associated with entered into the system, so they're tracked when we, they do the 411 every year. Okay. Um, and then as far as reducing property tax, how much are we asking? It depends. If you went with the 3836, this has already said that it's the first 75,000 off the building and it's for three years. So it's already well defined what it is and how to apply it. Um, and that equates to about $500 in municipal tax and to be determined if it would affect education tax, because I believe it has to be approved by the VEPC to do so. Part of the next steps we want to take. Can and I, then, so I can ask a question on that? Correct. I, so if we have a house that's if we're doing this in a with a house that's fallen that the town's tax would go down the first twenty five thousand would not be taxed, right? The yeah, assessed grand list value would be yes, yeah, seventy five thousand off would the assessment. The school tax be for the whole property as well. Correct. So there are some of these statutes that the municipal side will be reduced. And side. then the education side is not reduced and the town makes it up. We do that, for example. Oh, well, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt. Yeah. This is a great example of how we've come to the end of our knowledge <laughs> and we need a lawyer because yes. Tina and I do not agree on this. So we don't, yeah. we, don't, we, we really don't want to get into this level of detail. We just want to ask That's why you, we want to go to the VLCT. Right. Or and or an attorney, and it's worthwhile for us to even continue down this path and this adventure. Um, Susan, do you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question of, and I don't know, maybe you don't know, you haven't gotten this far in, in your own analysis, yeah, yeah. but I'm wondering, you know, obviously, I read 3836 to say it would reduce the education tax as well, but so that's going to raise everyone else's in town right. tax to some degree. Is that an amount the EDC is proposing? To make <clears throat> No, Susan, Susan, we're not proposing that the education taxes are, are cut. And so we'd like to work with a lawyer to work out how to do this. So that's not part of our proposal. OK, so then even limiting the town tax, obviously, that's going to reflect every, on everyone else's tax bills. It may not be significant, but I, I'm, that's where my question is. is that Right. So with the with the ADUs, because they were never there, it's yeah. it's like you you didn't tax them. Yes. Yeah. So whether people are going to pick up a little bit of extra 
but it's not like you're reducing um it's not like you're reducing some people's tax they're just not going to get the extra yeah correct so on the two hundred thousand dollar example to build the adu say that's their assessed value is increased by that amount we're just re uh that's all new to the grand list minus the seventy five thousand on that statute so the town still sees an increase of 125,000 in assessed value being taxed. So that wasn't there before because it's new development. So, so what happens if somebody sells the house? This goes away. We could put that in there. I just, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. That's some of these are going to be more detailed that we need to ask the attorney, but I would assume that if, if the ownership, the statute follows the owner, and if you're voting in, this parcel is going to be in it. Actually, it falls to the land. So if it's three years, they would probably be set for three years, whether they sell it or not. But I, those are legal questions yeah. we need to ask. So, so when, when you sorry, can I start? Uh, when you're talking about uh, the youth and VLCT for law, are you hoping a referral through the town so the services are free? Are you looking for an attorney? You're shaking your head, Joe. So you're hoping for a referral for a free consultation mm -hmm. with a lawyer? Yes, we're wondering how far we can go with free legal services, and it might be that they say not very far, and then we we'll three hours. <laughs> we have a lawyer that we're working with on the rest of the housing programs, so we'd probably revert to him. But we okay. wanted to explore this route. Okay, sorry, Ray. I interrupted you. Question for the attorney. I'm writing. Well, my I guess my question was going to be who's going to pay for the attorney? Yeah, ADC funds. So. How much? Yes. Yes. This is an like, e yeah. we're talking yeah. about an EDC program that we want to approve and we we could do that with EDC funds. I'm going to change the conversation when I talk about the next yeah. option. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, just to clarify that the, the this that we're talking about paying for that we're asking tonight is for to give to please we're just I don't know that we needed to ask permission to call the VLCT for free advice as part of our membership, but we're asking for that. that. No one's going to pay anything for what we're asking for tonight. If once we run out, once we speak with the VLCT attorneys and they tell us what they can tell us, if that's not sufficient for us to come back to you with a proposal, then the housing working group has funds for legal support for the how for the all across the board for the housing programs. That's a piece of their they've allocated a small piece of their budget for kind of legal advice to, and so forth. And we'll start to use that, but hopefully we, we may not need to, you know, we, we're, there's no, there's no, no one is committing any money tonight. We're just asking you, can we call the VLCT? Is that correct, Joe? Yes. It's pretty simple request. We're doing, I mean, maybe we didn't need to ask. Well, so it's, well, but it's not asking. only that it's, uh, is the select board interested yeah, I mean, if, in going but, this route because it doesn't feel like it's just an EDC matter. Yeah, and we don't want to waste your time, I guess, is that's the point. If we're, yeah. if, we're if you're dead set against this, no matter what the lawyers say, then we won't waste the time. Monthly tax breaks last for the entirety of the three years. Three years. Three, three years. years. And if you're using a tax stabilization agreement, those are capped at ten years, but you can define the period within your your stabilization program. Can I just it just make the duration oh. shall not exceed three years? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so year, can year. I can may I ask you to put, raise up and not get into the detail because we do not know that the detail is correct. We're not lawyers, and yeah. you can ask questions till the cows come home, and we don't know the answers, but a lawyer does. The question is: Are you interested in exploring tax relief? as an option to help the housing situation in Woodstock. Yeah. I am. Yeah. No, I would say that no. yeah, we should go forward. My yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll go forwards and we'll work out how to, what to do, what we can do, how to do this well. And come back to you with, yeah, with a proposal. Yeah. Once again. A formal. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's go on to the next one, which is trickier. Thank you. So the next one is talking about existing long-term landlords who are doing the right thing and renting their homes um, to local workers and very often keeping the rent below market rent. 
So this was an issue that came from you to ask us, is there something that we should be doing to help existing landlords, not just new one, not just new units? This is an issue that the EDC hasn't come to agreement on yet as to whether we want to expand our objective to um, maintain long-term rental units. Um, our objective right now is just to increase the number of them. So as we've looked at alternative solutions to help the property landlord who is doing the right thing, we could use this property um, tax stabilization again in this way. We could identify, or, or actually they would self-identify. So people could come to us and say, I have this unit and I am renting it at this particular rent. And it is, uh, it could have a market rent or a short-term rental rate of blah, blah, blah. And then they're asked, they would ask for a tax reduction. We would probably suggest that the rates, the rent rates that they charge are something that we use on our other programs because we're keeping track of rental rates and um, our, our current people in our programs have to promise to rent below a certain rent. So this is pushing the envelope a little bit further than the first proposal. And, the co and because this is reducing people's tax, this is actually saying the whole community will pick up that difference and share it. Um, hey Joe, is this a proposal for tonight or just a conversation? It's a conversation and to ask the same questions. Um, is the town interested in following this up and working out the detail to find out from a legal perspective to find out how this could work? And this is the one that should the cost start incurring a lot, we're not sure that the EDC funds will completely cover it. So we would be more cautious. We we are being more cautious as the EDC Housing Working Group. And so this was Susan's question from before that this is a scenario where the tax will actually go down and then someone have to cover the tax. Yes. Susan Ford's tax will go down, but then Laura has to cover that difference or everyone else covers that difference. So, okay. Yes. So we'd want to do some modeling to show the impact of this on other uh, taxpayers, I, I would think. If you give one person the um, an incentive, how does it work out for everybody else? You could model that. The, the one thing we don't know is how many long-term rental owners there are and how many would take advantage of this. It's a bit of a big unknown. And this wouldn't be, I don't, I'm not in the details, but again, this, this, wouldn't, this would be from the day they apply not going back to when they started doing renting apartments. Yes, it would be it would be a new program, so you'd have to say from now. I think, otherwise, who knows? You could go back fifty years, Eric. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think it, after, it would be in effect after it was voted on to move forward with it and do the tax stabilization. Are we asking Jill the same request about to get some legal advice as to how this would work and work out the details? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think it's also more is a. Is the board excited about this proposal? No, no, no right, correct. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and if you if you are, the, the next step would be to get free legal advice. If you're not, then there is no next step. Right. Again, this is in response to the question you asked: What could we do for existing existing homeowners who are rent who are already renting to work for workers? And so the answer and, is we could give them. Low market rates is key here. Right. But they are they are getting the money from the EDC, correct? No, these no. are people that no, we are... that's a, that's okay. the big that's right. a big question so, to debate. Existing landlords. So existing landlords who are renting at market or low but are not part of the EDC program currently. Okay. Right. So so, they, so every sorry, Ray, carry on. I was gonna say so basically instead of the EDC funding this, the town will fund this. Every single person in the town who is right. not that's applying to this program will pay a little bit towards it. Okay. This has the potential to affect market rates for rent in the area. It's one example of something positive that could come out of it too, in addition to rewarding those that are doing the right thing already. I'm wondering if there's any way to find out, you know, just, I don't know, more than an anecdote of if there are people that actually, I mean, I, you know, I 
would be interested. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, if the EDC was funding this like they were funding everybody else, I'd have no problem with it. But now you're asking all the taxpayers to pick up a program that the EDC started and in, in oversees. No, um, no, no, no. We no, haven't no. started this. Pro we haven't started no, this program, Ray. No, no. But, new but program. I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the the housing program, the, the incentive. Well, we we have a housing program, and we have so we have a housing right. initiative going on, and we have certain programs. In each year, we take a look at what programs we have and what programs we'd like to add, and then we go and ask for money. This is a program that we haven't asked for any money from the EDC at all, and we're actually saying, could it be could there be a contribution from everybody in town, not just EDC funds? But but just to be clear, Ray, this is not, the, the people who would be eligible for this are not currently eligible for the EDC programs. Correct. Right. And that, that that's was the I'm question. Yeah. That, that, and that's what the question was back last April and whenever it was, is what can EDC, EDC do to fund people that are already renting at below market rates or at market rates that, that aren't raising the rents. So I see. I, okay, I, I sorry. If the question was what can the EDC do, then this is premature. We'll go back as an EDC. We have not. We're not recommending this or not recommending it. The working group wanted to get a pulse from the select board, which we thought was fine. I, I remember the question is what can we do, and it was a royal we, so we didn't exclude the select board. But mm -hmm. if 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 you if that was the question, again, it's just, a, I didn't, we collectively may have remembered it slightly differently, but if the question was, what can the EDC do, then this does not answer, yet yet answer that question. We have more yeah. discussion. Right. Except, except that we can go down the same route, right? And consult with lawyers and start yeah. working out the numbers. And then we, we, first of all, we go to the EDC and say, is this something you, you could, you would be interested in? And if so, great. And if not, then we come to you and say, do you want to do it? Right. Or do we want to recommend it to the voters as far as? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Roger, you have a question. Right, Roger. Um, I just like to suggest that you go forward with the exploration on this, this last option. I think we should look for every arrow in the quiver. Obviously, we need to model it and know if it's going to raise my taxes by $100, great. If it's going to raise my taxes by $5,000, not so great. I mean, so, I, you know, I think it's worth it. And we're not going to solve it with one room. We're going to solve it with, or maybe not solve it, but at least affect it with a whole bunch of things. And my only concern is, you know, spending $3,000 in legal fees to find that there's nobody that applies. <laughs> oh, <but. laughs> well, yeah. Certainly, I would I would think that the person who brought the question first to the select board would want to apply, and he has about three or four units. Yeah. So, so we we've got baseline. But I think what you're saying, Susan, is is part of the work we should do before we come back to the select board and and with the EDC, we'd, we'd ask the same question: is how, how is the question you, questions you ask, Susan, which is you know how, what's the scope of this, right? Yeah. So, Joe, let's let's just add that, you know, try to figure that out. Gauge interest. OK, okay. well, we could, and we could what we could do is limit the scope, right? We could say the first this number who apply and then that could give us a defined amount of money just to run it as a as an experiment. All right. Well, we can take that offline I and mean, the EDC can do that. I don't know that the select board can give, you know, seven tax exam. Anyway, we need to ask a lawyer, as you said. Lots of questions. The, we've reached the limit. Okay. So. Uh, can I just, for my own edifice, recap that the ADU multi-unit, you are very much interested in us doing our homework on that one and the statute that's already readily available. And existing landlord gave some interest, um, find out to the modeling, but maybe spend less time on it if it's going to end up spending a lot of time with an attorney to create some type of stabilization. Unless you know that the population is out there. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go we'll go forwards. Yep, appreciate it. The, se the second and third items, just very quickly. The second one does relate to housing, but I I would just like to um, present it. It's it's an it, it's really an it's really an accounting uh, type issue. 
when we created all of the housing programs, we created them, I think mistakenly, as two separate grants and two separate programs, and we allocated specific pools of funds to them. One was to ADUs, which legally I'm told by Jill and Trina is a single unit. There's no such thing as a two unit ADU. There's a multi-unit thing. Am I using the right words, Jill? A multi-unit thing and an ADU. Yes. And we originally had an ADU program. We then started getting people who, who came to us and said, we'd like to build more than one unit to which our reaction, I think appropriately was great, but and, but because it was because they're legally two different things and our process is slightly different, the permitting is slightly different and the names are different. We made the mistake of creating a separate grant. We got approval from you for that and we put X tens of thousands of dollars into that. It turns out that the both programs achieve the identical objective, which is the building of ADUs. The only the only difference other than the permitting process, the criteria are the same, the incentive is the same, it's $10,000 per unit. The only difference is that we call them something different. We now find that we didn't quite predict what the mix was and we're running out, we have more demand in one pool and less demand in the other. And we'd like to combine the two pools of money without allocating any more money and just basically call it a ADU slash multi-unit program. We'd like to just combine the two grants, put the funds together, and now if we get more single unit applications, we'll use the money for that. It's first come, first serve until we run out of funds. If we get more multi-unit applications, we'll use the funds for that. It's just operationally, you know, we don't want to have to turn down someone who who's, wants to build an ADU because we don't have any single unit funds left. We only have multi-unit funds left, but no one wants to build multi-units and or vice versa. And we've already run out of run into this once and, and we don't want to. And so we, and we're running into this problem now, and we don't want to say no to someone who wants to build an ADA. It doesn't make any sense. So these were the ones that were approved in uh, March of 2022. So Correct. one was rental. No, 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 this was these. Well, the rent, this has nothing to do with the rental program. There's three I, programs, one rental program and two, what I think of as ADU programs, but but one is a single ADU program. One is a multiple unit program. You can't call it an ADU, I guess. Right. But I, I looked at the um, grants for, the, was this done after March of uh, 2022? I, I believe the multi-unit one was done afterwards, wasn't it, Jill? But the single unit one was done in March. Yes, we we didn't introduce a multi-unit one till 2023, did we? Right, I think that's correct. So, so Ray, we we I think we added funds to the to the eight single unit one in, in 2023 in April. In this discussion, I believe, if I recall right, I could check. I thought we added funds to the single unit one and created the multi-unit one. But we certainly. Uh, uh, you, you could be right. I don't have that information. Okay. Me. But anyway, all of these. You just want to lump them together. We just want to lump them together. It's to say it doesn't. We know we're not asking for any more funds. It's just an administ. Really, it's an administrative thing. We'll continue. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. Right. And the yeah. town may have them all in the same pot anyway, as far as the accounting goes. No, no I don't Trina, know. they don't. Um, the, sorry. So you could you're, you could be putting a burr in the saddle for their administrative process, though. But no, 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 Trina. No, there's no change to the administrative process. It's it's not. We just don't have to get. We can say a unit. We have a housing unit that we want to approve. Period. It doesn't matter if it's ADU or multi-unit. They're going to take the money out of the right bucket. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We're, there's going to be yes, correct. We, that will all be done properly. All right. Probably should, yeah. I just, right. yeah. I move that we allow the EDC to combine the EDU and the and multi unit pot for their grant and purpose. Does that do it? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The last one is. This is allocating 500 and uh, sorry, up to $535 to for a grant to a group of not for profit organizations that are providing food service on the green. 
uh, as you know, the trustees approved the the um, well, Seton, why don't you just explain very briefly? Seton, in effect, the trustees are the applicant, and the EDC approved this unanimously. As with all grants, we come to the select board for approval. Um, yeah, so uh, long story short, as we've had in previous years, um, there's not a lot of food options on Sundays and Mondays. The trustees have spent uh, a lot of time trying to figure out how we can best serve residents, workers, and of course, tourists. Um, and knowing that foliage is the busiest time of year, we asked um, people to serve food on the green on Sundays and Mondays. We got a lot of responses from from nonprofits, um, and one of the but one of the catches that we discovered early on was there is a requirement um, when you have a permit on the green to have a certificate of insurance. Um, it obviously protects the the municipality, the taxpayers, and it also protects the whoever's doing the the serving or an event on the green. So that's a requirement. Um, a lot of commercial places for those one day things, it can get into the hundreds of dollars. And so those nonprofits very quickly said, you know, thanks for the offer, but this is gonna cut too much into our profits. Um, fortunately, I was at the VLCT town fair at the time. So I was able to grab somebody who literally owns our, manages our insurance and, and ask for a suggestion. She turned me on to a, a program that is administered uh, through VLCT that does one day insurance, but for a much lower rate. Um, so we were able to get that that cost down to about $75 a day um, for, for a one day event, which is much cheaper than anything that you would Google. Um, and then the next question was, you know, that was still pretty steep for some of the nonprofits. So in conversations um, with Eric, um, and with some people at VLCT, we heard that other towns, you know, sort of had little pots of money they held sort of to the side and would um, use that for nonprofits to to defer those costs. So we talked about that possibility and then said, hey, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this is because we have a lot of tourists and we have a wonderful marketing team that is bringing droves in. So, hey, maybe the EDC can help us out. Um, so John generously added it to an agenda. Um, and it looks like it's gonna be, as you said, no more than 500 some odd dollars. Um, I'm still getting the receipts in, um, but if you've been in the village for the past couple of weeks, you know that uh, you know there was one day that the um, Welcome Center got over 2000 people. I mean, it's it's been literally unprecedented this year. And um, I know those groups, at some point we've had two groups on the green, at some point we've had four and they've all run out of food. So we, we think it was really successful, um, but we just wanted to make sure that since they are sort of providing a service for, for us and helping us with tourists and, and feeding people that are here, um, that we wanted to make that as easy as possible. And, um, and if that was the incentive to, to get food, then, then that's fine. And, and we would sort of consider it a, a pilot project this year. And uh, as we look at foliage next year, decide if it's something we wanna do again. So is this reimbursement? Yeah, it's reimbursement. So the, the COIs obviously had to be purchased before they right. their set up. Yes. Okay. So this is the EDC recommends this. This is a regular EDC grant. We it we thought it was economic development for the reasons that Seton said. So we we're recommending it. And I'll say one of the biggest complaints I hear is people come here on Sunday, Mondays, and there's nowhere to eat. And we we'll do the work through mostly Seton. We we solved that issue this year. And I just anecdotal one Monday, I walked by to soup sign. Call my wife. So what soup she wanted went back and was already gone. So they've been very successful. And uh funny for you, not for me. <laughs> I go home and say without soup. <laughs> um, but I think they're very successful and I think it gives an option to increase tourism on those days and have an option for people. So it's very good. I'm not sure we need to increase tourism. Yeah, really. Do <laughs> <laughs> okay. a motion? I move we move the request. 535. All those in favor? Aye. Thanks. Okay, you're all set. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everybody. And I could just thank Seton for it. Seton did a lot of legwork on this for the trustees and the nonprofits uh, working over the weekends and organized the whole thing. So uh, thank you for all your work you did. And next up is Stuart Bailey. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.
for your favorite topic. <laughs> uh, so the first one is before Mechanic Street. Um, it's our understanding that the resident did not update the address with us, so the sewer bill is mailed to the old address. Um, the resident has paid the, the, the total bill, uh, but then asked for an abatement uh, for the interest that, that accrued um, for not paying it. It will be denied. All right. Hmm? Jumping the gun, like, yeah. I think they have to have the responsibility of updating the address with us. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. I saw on the bill that there's two addresses. Yeah. It's for Mechanic and 47 Pleasant. And so I just didn't know. And is it post on? Well, that's. Oh, that's not post. Okay. Ours. But yeah. yeah, the two on the bill. There's two on the bill. And so I guess my question is which one did we send it to? And are they up? Uh, no, the four mechanic is the name of their LLC. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So we would have mailed that 47 Pleasant Street. So the bill, it looks like, went to 47 Pleasant, and that's the address that she put on the abatement request. Now, this bill was printed after oh, they paid, so it could have been updated at a time, and her the old address could not be anywhere there. Still think that it's incumbent on the taxpayer to notify the town. We can't call the town and send. I don't think we can expect town employees to go. There's two there's two penalties here. So there's two bills that she's right. There's a February penalty and a April penalty that she incurred. It was also um I believe the same thing happened last year. They didn't pay the bill on time as well. So I don't know if that's a hangover from the year before oh. or not. Ah. It's going on for more than a year? I uh, know the same issue occurred last year as well for the same person. And they still didn't get the mailing yeah. address right? Um, apparently. apparently. So no, they, they were delinquent two years. So she just barely paid for both years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a long time. Is there a motion? We deny the request. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The next one is a repair. Yep, they are in place, their old sewer line with a new one. It's going in the exact same place. I don't have the information. My assumption is it is, but we can. Um, yeah, if, it, if it's not, it might need to go to the state as well. Yeah, and then we'll have to also probably go to um, our board as well for permit too. Okay. Yeah. So, but if it's just pulling it out, putting it right back in, then it's. Yeah. No, they don't make sense. That makes sense because I know I know he had to clean it. It says here replace by... old sewer line with new, so yeah. you would assume. It'd be in the same place. It's in yeah. the same. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is there a motion to approve that? I move we approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then approve the minutes. Now, um, my only correction is at the end when we were talking about the approving of the previous minutes. I know I'm a multitasker, but I somehow moved and seconded. Okay. Oh, good job. <laughs> we just need you want to try that again. <laughs> <laughs> if we could I can fix else. that. <laughs> I can look at who actually did it. Okay. Okay, so motion to approve the minutes. I move we approve with that correction. All those in favor? Need Aye. a second other than oh. me. Greg, you have to second it. I'll second it. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. I'm gonna abstain because I wasn't. Yes, thank you. Motion to adjourn. We second or we vote? Just moving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Meeting. I'll second. All those in favor? Good night. Good night. I just want to say that hours is really long. <laughs> <laughs>